Okay, good evening again, everybody. We're going to make a start. And I, I have to say that we've got over 800 people registered for today on Zoom. So I'm hoping that uh, it all goes well for you. And we've also got people watching on Facebook. Um, this is a, a joint webinar between Keeper NHS Public and Health Campaigns Together. And it's, and it's called Coronavirus, What Now for the NHS? Um, I'm Tony O'Sullivan. I'm a retired paediatrician. I worked for the NHS for many years. I cut my NHS campaigning teeth on the Save Lewisham Hospital campaign. And now for the last few years, I'm co-chair of the national organization, Keeper NHS Public, with the other co-chair, John Puntus in Leeds. The, the aims tonight are to look at some of the reasons for the UK's very worrying response to the coronavirus pandemic, the national tragedy, international tragedy indeed, to learn lessons from this that are, are, are relevant to uh, our call for new policy on the NHS and social care. Uh, and also we've got a, another event that is beyond this, which is uh, a five day free to view screening festival of the film Under the Knife. So that's the third point. Um, for the speakers who I'm going to introduce in a minute, you can have, please have yourself on, on the mute function um, uh, and then we should have better connection. Um, there's also a chat function uh, if people want to communicate with each other. And I'm going to get going now with a, but first of all, with a short tribute to Pete Gillard. There's very few people in the UK at the moment that hasn't been touched very personally by coronavirus. And we have lost one of our um, best members, a member of the executive of Key Parenthesis Public, an officer and treasurer of Health Campaigns Together. Pete Gillard died very recently. We miss him very badly. And um, there is a tribute to his life uh, online on Saturday, which many of you may, may well join. Now going on to thank very warmly our panel guests tonight. I'm going to ask them to speak initially for three minutes each. And then we've had many, many questions from the public for the panel to discuss. Um, and I'm going to therefore put the questions sometimes collated from more than one person to the, to the panelists to get their responses. And hopefully that will be a discussion and, and a, a, a lively one. Um, First of all, thanks very much to Nina Modi for accepting a very late invitation. Nina is Professor of Neonatal Medicine and Consultant at Imperial College London and the Chelsea and Westminster Hospital. Nina is also President of the Medical Women's Federation nationally and is the immediate past President of the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health. That's my own college. And she's also director of the Neonatal Data Analysis Unit. I'd also like to welcome Sonia Adesara, who is a junior doctor and a member of Key Power NHS Public, and also a member of, of our NHS Staff Voices Group within KOMP. And she has courageously been in the forefront in media interviews on, and on platforms, campaigning for many issues around the NHS and including on the question of protection for staff with PPE. She was an important witness about that in the Panorama programme last Monday and was then attacked in the Daily Mail for being an activist, uh, that's a crime these days, and a supporter of Keeper NHS Public, which was described as a hard left group. That's news to me. But <laughs> but that's, that's what the Daily Mail was trying to do. Alison Pollock is our next speaker and she's consultant in public health. She's professor and director uh, of the Centre for Excellence in Regulatory Science at the University of Newcastle. Alison's a founder member of Keeper NHS Public, which was uh, set up in 2005. And she's also the author with Peter Roderick of the draft NHS reinstatement bill. 
So it's great to have Alison with us as well. John Lister, is, uh, his campaigning, if he doesn't mind me saying so, goes back to the 80s. He's co-editor co of the brilliant online journal, The Lowdown. And if you don't know about that, you should do uh, lowdownnhs.info. John is also editor of Health Campaigns Together, now in its fifth year. And Health Campaigns Together was his vision as a campaigning umbrella for key branches, public and other organisations working with the TUC and other unions to campaign together for the NHS. And finally, Pam Kleinot. Pam used to work as a journalist, is a trained psychotherapist, and worked for the NHS before she turned her talents to producing films. Her excellent film, Under the Knife, will be available free to view in a festival screening from 9 p.m. this evening until midnight on Sunday. I must say that Richard Horton was an invited guest who, who agreed to speak, and uh, that was uh, in all our publicity. I'm very sorry to say, and he apologizes, that yesterday he had to pull out at the last minute because of pressure of work. Um, so this is our panel, and I'm going to start with Pam. And I'm going to ask Pam to explain how she sees the, the powerful messages in her film, Under the Knife, how they relate to the response in Britain to the coronavirus pandemic. So thank you, Pam. Thank you, Tony. Um, when um, Susan Steinberg and I made the film, we didn't realise how relevant it would be with this public health crisis. The NHS has been systematically dismantled and undermined over the years with cuts, closures, underfunding and austerity. It's understaffed and fragmented and it was on its knees. And despite warnings from a pandem pandemic drill in 2016 and the lessons from Wuhan, Italy and Spain, the UK government was not prepared for coronavirus and the result has been needless deaths. The lack of PPE, testing, tracing, and what has happened in care homes has made it a national scandal. The tragedy is that, that we have in the UK one of the greatest institutions that humanity has ever created, the NHS. When it began in 1948, it was revolutionary in providing free health care for everyone and became the gold standard of the world. Under the knife traces, the marketization of the NHS, which began with Margaret Thatcher and has continued for more than 30 years with the advancing wave of neoliberal thought that led to the crippling private financial initiative and other forms of privatization. The film looks at the socio-economic issues where many people died because they, before there was an NHS because they could not afford healthcare. This pandemic has highlighted how the virus is affecting a disproportionate amount of black ethnic minorities, including NHS frontline staff. Black ethnic minority doctors account for 44% of the NHS workforce. They sustain it. The lies and deception of successive governments dates from Margaret Thatcher promising in 1982 that the NHS is safe in our hands. Former Tory MP Michael Portillo admitted the Tories lied in their 210 election manifesto because they didn't believe they would win if they told the electorate their plans for the NHS because people are so wedded to the NHS. It's like a national religion. Under the Knife looks in depth at the 212th Health and Social Care Act, which signaled the end of a truly national health service with fragmentation, and opened the floodgates to privatization. It was chilling to learn that 200 MPs and peers with vested interests in private health care voted for the legislation. As Lord Owen said in the film, governments woo people, he did it himself, with a peerage here and a knighthood there. He warned that the government was surreptitiously preparing the UK for an American type health system which we all know has bankrupted many and made healthcare unavailable to many. And we have seen how it has failed the people of America in this pandemic. Former Prime Minister John Major 
So the NHS is about as safe with Boris Johnson and Michael Gove as a pet hamster in the presence of a hungry python. The film ends on an optimistic note, illustrating how communities, healthcare professionals, and campaigners have fought successfully to save hospitals. At the daily press conference of the health crisis, we are given the mantra of following the science and doing the right thing at the right time. There's no apology, no remorse, just, about, just a whitewash of the deadly mistakes. The pandemic has highlight, highlighted the public health emergency and only a national health service is suitable to get through it. It needs proper funding and proper ownership. Health is not a luxury, it is a right. And we need to get rid of the business model with all its wastage of bureaucracy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pam, that was great. Can I move on now to, to Nina, Nina Modi and, and ask you to speak next? Thank you. Thank you. Th thank you very much, Tony, and good evening, everyone. I was very pleased indeed to be invited to join you today, and I'm looking forward to hearing the, the discussion. Um, as Tony has said, I am, um, I am a clinician, I'm a neonatologist, um, I'm also a researcher, and I've held and hold a number of professional roles. And I guess I should make clear at the outset that I'm not here representing any particular organisation. Um, I'm speaking for myself. And I should also make clear that I am not a member of any political party. I am, however, very proud to say I am an advocate for at the NHS. And when I use the phrase NHS, I think this underlines a number of problems that we have in discussing the situation and in the dialogue that takes place today. Because of course, the, the, the word NHS does not mean today what it meant in its original form. The NHS, originally meant a wonderful, absolutely wonderful health service, free at the point of need, available to all, funded through public taxation. But what we've seen increasingly over the years is the, um, the weakening of those fundamental principles to the detriment of the well-being of the, the UK public, and also to the detriment of the understanding of how a health service can be so very, very magnificent, uh, um, not only in the UK, but that understanding around the world has been diminished by the diminishment of the National Health Service. So as we go through this discussion today, I'd like you to bear in mind that when the phrase NHS is used, what we have today in the UK is a very, very fragmented patchwork of providers. Um, there is fragmentation across the four nations, there's fragmentation within England, there is fragmentation between the acute services, the community services, general practice services, and so on. Um, and each and every one of these fragmented components of what we call the National Health Service is being forced to function as a business. Many of the components of the service are now uh, provided not by the public sector, but by for-profit or by the non-NHS non sector, and that too brings with it great, great difficulty in ensuring that we have consistent, demonstrably high quality care across the whole country. This has been played out and I'm sure we will discuss later on this evening in the debacle over the lack of personal protective equipment during the COVID-19 crisis and in the inconsistency in some of the guidance that has been issued as the days have gone by and also within services within the country. So again, Tony, Chief Baroness, NHS Public, thank you very much for inviting me for, to be with you this evening, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Nina. And I have to say, the three years that you were president of the Royal College of Pediatrics was a, a great period for children and their mothers. Um, Sonia is next, if that's okay, Sonia. Uh, just unmute yourself when you're ready. Hello. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, so I think, for, I feel the, this virus has exposed that the, the politics of austerity over the past 10 years um, and the politics of complacency and incompetence over the past few months um, has and continued to cost lives. To learn from this virus, I think we do need to acknowledge that mistakes have been made 
um, the delay to go down, um, the failure to stockpile, um, the degrading of our public health system, which meant that we were unable to do mass community testing and tracing. Um, these mistakes and many more have been costly. Um, but for me as a healthcare professional, what I found most um, frustrating is just the, the, you know, the abject failure of our political leaders to not, own, to not have the integrity to acknowledge these mistakes. And then yet week after week after week, we've had continued um, spin and dishonesty um, and, and just a quite deliberate um, attempt to undermine and discredit um, people who are working in the NHS, NHS trying to speak out. Um, I also feel that this virus has shined a spotlight on the brutal inequalities that we already knew existed in our society. The ONS statistics that were released last week that showed that people living in more deprived areas, um, black and ethnic minorities that were disproportionately dying from this virus. Um, you know, to be honest, this shouldn't be surprising to any of us. Um, we already knew pre-coronavirus that if you were born in the poorest parts of this country, on average, your life expectancy would be nine years less than those in the wealthiest. We already knew pre-COVID virus that black and ethnic minorities have poorer health outcomes, um, face greater barriers, accessing healthcare, in part due to government policies, um, and were at greater risk of premature death. So I think going forward, we need to be very careful around the narrative of this, that we don't allow this narrative that these health inequalities are unexpected and needs to be investigated because we already know the factors that underlie these quite stark health inequalities. Um, and I do feel that narrative allows um, us to divert attention and scrutiny away from those in power who have allowed these inequalities to persist um, and actually continue to support policies that further drive and sustain these inequalities and injustices. Um, and then just to finish and to conclude, um, I think this virus, you know, it's clear that this virus has exposed um, and laid, laid war that the failings of this government and, you know, the sheer arrogance of some of our politicians um, has cost lives. Um, but this virus has also showed what we already knew to be true, that inequality kills, that poverty kills, that racism kills. Um, and unless those in power have the humility to learn from mistakes um, and acknowledge these injustices and actually have a genuine commitment to address these injustices and these inequalities, um, we will continue in the future to have unnecessary lives lost. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sonia. Thank you. Thank you for your passion. Um, before I go on to the last two speakers in this initial round, could I just remind everybody that uh, if you want to make comments, there's a chat function, which uh, I'm sure most of you know, but if you click on chat, if you can see that, uh, you can then see what people are posting as we go through the session. So um, can I move on now to Alison Pollock, please? If, if you could um, mute you. and start video. Great, and start video, Hi. great. Hi, good Welcome evening again. everybody. And thanks Tony and everyone for organizing this. Um, just to say, uh, I'm also not a member of any political party, but I've the, um, got the honor of being the president of the Socialist Health Association. And I'm also um, on the new independent SAGE committee that uh, Sir David King convened. And you can watch the hearing from yesterday. I'm afraid it's two hours and 40 minutes long, so you might get a bit tired. But there will be a report from that and a follow-up. Um, so I'm not going to repeat what everybody else has said, but I think um, what COVID's done is it's exposed the huge inadequacies in our health and social care systems. And for England, I'm not calling it a national health service because we had the Health and Social Care Act 2012, which is basically the dismantling and abolishing act. But of course, in Scotland and Wales, they still have an NHS. Um, but uh, the politicians clearly got really alarmed um, towards the 23rd of March when we went into the lockdown. Um, that this would, this site, the spectre of our hospitals filling up 
and the ICU beds not being able to cope anymore. And so this lockdown is a result of, is really a combination of two things. One is the lack of capacity within our, our NHS, and I'll come back to that. And also the extraordinary delay in doing uh, contact tracing and putting in any travel restrictions. There's still no quarantine in place. Um, so uh, what we've had now, of course, is a huge response on the acute hospital side with the government buying ineffectual ventilators and these Nightingale hospitals, which are rapidly turning into white elephants. And so we've got rising death tolls. Um, unfortunately, the government does these daily instead of we should have these weekly through our nests with an official statistician reporting them because these daily data don't mean anything because they're not accurate and they're not a reflection of what's going on. But we've got these rising death tolls. But the other part of the story that the government has not presented to us is the excess non-COVID deaths because the lockdown is doing an enormous amount of harm. It's doing harm by creating social isolation. Uh, it's also causing harm, especially for the poor, for vulnerable groups uh, and for children. And children for the first time have been deprived of their right to education, but we've also seen the undermining of a lot of rights for vulnerable groups and vulnerable children. Um, and especially uh, people in care homes and receiving social care where their rights to care have been uh, considerably downgraded to those necessary uh, for human life really. Um, so, um, and if you want to read about that, you can look at my website um, to see the articles and editorials we've written on this. Um, so a lot of attention was focused on the acute hospital and building hospitals in nine days and getting the ventilators and of course all the PPE stuff. But of course the other area where the government has really abysmally failed is in nursing care and social care. And that's because it's the most uh, fragmented and privatised sector that there is. Um, a lot of the long-term care was originally under the NHS till 1990. But there are now over 400,000 people compared to fewer than 120,000 odd beds in the NHS. There are 400,000 people in residential and nursing home care settings and um, they and staff, there are 1.6 million staff, most of whom are 25% are, are on short term contracts and not on low pay and not in receipt of um, uh, proper sickness pay, they're on statutory benefit. So it's no surprise that what's been happening is the carers have been taking the virus into the homes, but the government uh, failed to act, it failed to do two things. It should have really um, put in place measures to requisition the homes and to put the staff on national terms and conditions to take over the staff so that it knew what was going on in the homes. And if it had doubled and tripled the staff and redeployed staff from the quiet bits of the health service, we'd have been much better place. It also unfortunately kept GPs out and it kept the community health services out. And yet this is the most vulnerable group. But the other thing it did was it kept relatives out and um, relatives are the eyes and ears of quality of a home. So they've not been into the home for six weeks. And this is an appalling state of affairs for people who are very frail perhaps in their last few months of life, and then not to have their family with them when they're dying. So we really have no idea what's been going on in these homes, and we really have no idea um, what's been happening to the staff either, because the government didn't do the contact tracing. So when a case happened, they should have been contacting, the looking at the nurses, looking at the residents, looking at the care staff and actually quarantining and isolating. So there are many excess deaths now in the nursing homes which would have been avoidable. Not helped by the fact that the hospitals were so desperate to clear out their beds, and remember these hospitals are now a third to a half full, um, uh, they were clearing out their beds, they've been discharging COVID patients and they've been discharging the elderly sometimes with COVID into nursing homes and this is a really shocking state of affairs especially when they're understaffed and under enormous pressure and I can't emphasize this enough that it's no good us talking now about um, 
we're getting back our NHS, we have to really have a national health and social care service which is truly integrated. And it's been the service that's been most abandoned uh, by geriatricians and medicine. Um, Nina's here so she can talk about what's been happening to older people. The other thing that's been exposed is not just the decimation of capacity, but the decimation of public health and a government which is intent on creating almost parallel systems centrally for data, for testing, uh, contact tracing, uh, using large um, multinationals. And I think it's really worrying that we have this hollowing out of local capacity and we've lost our capacity to respond to COVID and the local outbreaks because COVID is not made up of one national, the national epidemic is made up of thousands of outbreaks. Um, and you wouldn't call the fire brigade from London to put out the fire in Blackpool or Manchester. And yet you would need local outbreak teams to put out, local fire teams to put out the fire. But what the government's doing with its new app and its contact tracing and its track and trace approach and its testing is centralizing and privatizing instead of putting back the capacity that was decimated and ripped out of local authorities um, with their cuts. So um, uh, I won't go on much longer but I think uh, this lockdown in part has been created by 30 years of constant incremental erosion of our public services, including the NHS, um, and uh, the evisceration of local public services is uncoupling from local communities, uh, and of course the decimating, the, the, the cuts of the last 10 years. Um, and I think it's really up to us to continue to highlight this and to fight for legislation along the lines of the NHS bill, but also we need to now bring in um, a bill for, integrate a bill for a national health and care service. Because to my mind, care is a continuum and this is one of the most neglected areas of all. Uh, I'm not going to touch on children because Nina's going to, uh, Nina will do this uh, much more articulately as we um, go through uh, the questions. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Alison. That's that's great. And if if anyone does have the time, you should watch the Independent Sage panel, um, that, where, where the, the the independent experts were asking all the questions we've been shouting at the screen on a daily basis uh, for the uh, in the Downing Street briefings. Um, can I go on to introduce John Liston now, please, John? If you could unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> um, and uh, obviously, I uh, ag agree with all of the, uh, the, the the points made by the previous speakers. I'm going to just look at a couple of things that maybe have been part, uh, dealt with in passing by a couple of speakers, but look, look a little bit more, and particularly look at uh, privatisation in the current context. Um, we've just had this morning, obviously, m m as we woke up, the BBC were leading on the so-called NHS app that's being now uh, trialled in the particularly completely atypical scenario of the Isle of Wight. Uh, why on earth they think this is a, a realistic way in which you can trial a, a, an app like that with a large percentage of older people without smartphones who are clearly not going to be signing up for it. And um, it, it is, is a bit of a mystery, but it's clearly a private sector app. It's, it's made by a company uh, owned by a friend of Dominic Cummings, his brother or, or whatever. And it's some, it, anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a Tory, uh, a Tory crony who's actually got this uh, contract, uh, a 250 million pound contract without any proper tendering. And it's an app that is not compatible with the Apple and Google app that's being used by most of the European countries means that people, if, if this is introduced and rolled out across the country, people using that will not be able to travel to Europe. Um, and it's, it's a really bizarre, even the Daily Telegraph is pointing that out this morning. I mean, it's just, it's just a, 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 a typical of the way this has been done. If we look at the other aspects, the testing centres, which are ludicrously far apart, there's 31 of these uh, centres supposedly covering the whole of the United Kingdom. Uh, it's just an unbelievable. There's somebody from Norfolk as a key worker logged on uh, yesterday, I think it was, 
and was offered three places testing, one in Glasgow, one in Aberdeen, and one in Northern Ireland, all, all over 350 miles away. Um, so the idea that these testing centres, all of which are being privately run um, by, uh, contracted through Deloitte, but, include Deloitte, but also including uh, Mighty, GG4S, Serco, Sodexo, a long list of companies with a long record of failing to deliver uh, adequate services and, and failing to actually meet standards in, in, in the contracts they've had in the past with the NHS and other parts of the private sector, public sector. So the testing centres, uh, which, which of course we've got all, all of the manipulation that's gone on to make it look as if they're delivering the job, uh, they're, they're delivering adequate services, huge questions being asked over the quality of the testing that's going on in these services and whether or not it's actually uh, anything like uh, what is needed to actually uh, ad address the current crisis. But also we've got where, the, where, the, where do the, the uh, tests go? They go to a new network of super labs that have been set up again in, with the private sector involved in these super labs, three of them covering the whole country, ignoring completely a network of 44 NHS labs, which are unable to get the reagents and the testing kits uh, to deliver, uh, but between them would be much able, much more locally, much more swiftly, and, and with under regulation and accreditation, deliver a much better service uh, uh, w without going through the whole process of setting up these super labs. In other words, the government's instinct time and again is to actually turn to actually either create a parallel system or a completely privatised system rather than going through and developing the NHS uh, to do the job. It's the same with the NHS supply chain. We've had all the uh, uh, scandals and uh, the, the fiasco of the le lethal failure to deliver PPE to frontline staff. Uh, and when we look at the supply chain that was supposed to do that, it was privatised last year, reprivatised. It was originally DHL, one DHL contract, reprivatised into 13 separate contracts, most of which are actually run by private companies, which have proved to be completely dysfunctional. The army was brought in to try and sort it out and failed. They've set up a parallel supply line, which has failed. They've now got a supply czar who's also doomed to fail because the system has been fragmented beyond recovery. Now we're being told that NHS trusts locally are being refused, uh, are told, uh, instructed not to actually go and separately put, procure supplies of PPE, but to go through the newly dysfunctional system that's being created. Again, privatisation proving that it's utterly unable to deliver what's needed in a crisis situation or on a day-to-day -day service for the NHS. So we've got that, and, and uh, I, I think it's important to recognise that uh, you know within this, uh, not many people re put all these things together with privatisation, uh, but I think these, these are important. In the scheme of things, in terms of the actual scale of privatisation across the NHS, obviously it's, it's around 18 or 20 percent of NHS spending on private providers of clinical care. We've got, in addition to that, private providers of cleaning, catering and so on in, in hospital trusts. So it, it's still uh, the bulk of the NHS is NHS. But when you get the government which preferentially turns to the private sector whenever it possibly can, finds ways to carve out bits that might possibly make profits for the private sector, and that, that's the way the entire legislation has been structured, then we clearly in, 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 a, in, a, in a situation that can't continue. At the present time, the Health and Social Care Act, which forces privatisation of more of, the, more of these services at local level, is currently suspended. Uh, and we might expect that it would be possible to, for NHS England to actually uh, impose rather more rational policies, instead of which they appear to be headed uh, to bring in private contractors, for example, to clean the Nightingale hospitals. Uh, and Alison mentioned them as white elephants. They're not just white elephants, they're dead white elephants. So they're all closed. Uh, the, the, none of them had any patients uh, worth talking about. The last example in the London Nightingale was 12 patients being looked after by 200 staff who'd been dragged away from NHS Trust right around London to, to, to give a semblance of a continuity of service in a hospital that was never really needed and was never really properly uh, set up to actually do anything useful, but again gave profitable contracts to KPMG and a whole raft of private companies that have brought in and, and been used in, in, in setting them up. So I think when we come to the end of this and we look at where we go, rather than putting the old system back as it was in December uh, 2019, uh, we need to be saying, look, 
there are some things that have moved forward from, 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 from where we were. We've had the debts cancelled of NHS trusts. We've had uh, the NHS bill effectively suspended. Let's not bring it back. Let's strip it away now. Let's actually have a bill to reinstate, re-establish re, 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 re the NHS as a coherent public service. We've proven now that these various private providers are not only a uh, bad value for money, but actually cannot deliver quality service. Let's strip out those private contractors as well. Let's bring the entire service back in-house as an NHS and, as Alison said, reintegrate uh, the, again with the uh, care homes which once were in the public sector and, and have now uh, all been uh, in the private sector. Let's have a national health and care service run on an integrated basis. Even the Health Service Journal, as a major uh, um, uh, commentator, is now pointing out that strategic health authorities would have been a way of organising the response to COVID in a much more coherent way than has been done. They were stripped out by the Health and Social Care Act. We need to go back to the NHS as it was before Thatcher started marketising it and Tony Blair and then, and then Andrew Lansley drove forward a process of privatisation. And I think that this is the big lesson that we need to take out of it. We don't want to get the NHS back the way it was. We want it back the way it was before they started messing it up. We want to get it back as a public service, a coherent public service, an integrated public service. And we want the private contractors and their ripoffs and their various defunct and, and dysfunctional systems stripped out so that we can get back to care the way it should be. Thank you very much, John. Thank you. And thank you, thank all of you very much. Um, can I just make one comment that uh, a couple of our speakers have, have, have uh, given their political affiliations and uh, Keep Our NHS Public itself is a non-political, non-politically aligned organisation, although we regard ourselves as highly political as all the speakers here are by their very actions and what they say. So uh, um, I noticed uh, one comment in the chat flow uh, of, of people being surprised that we're announcing that we're not uh, politically aligned, but there's, there's a reason for us even raising it at the moment, which is the, uh, the attempt by the Daily Mail to, to, to intimidate and, and censor political activists. And so some of us are saying we're not afraid to say that we are politically aligned and of course, uh, I would I would argue that Boris Johnson is politically aligned, so I don't see why there shouldn't be opposition to that. Um, I'm going to now go into a different phase of this, which is uh, putting questions that are uh, in large part from the public that have sent in questions. And I'm going to ask one of you to address it, and then if uh, anybody else wants to add in to that, that's fine, if that's okay with you. I was going to start with Alison, if that's okay. Um, could you reveal yourself and unmute? Alison? Mute, yep. Oh, great. Uh, I, I was going to ask you two things. Um, in my mind, they're linked, but, they're, but I hope they are with, with you. One is, uh, um, we're, we're talking about the fact that UK started contact tracing at the end of, of January and February, and then they just stopped it. Uh, and I was just wondering if you could explain a little bit more your thoughts about what the, the, the government's rationale was in that extraordinary action. Um, and then the other thing is, in my head it's linked, but uh, that you're talking about the need for local action to yeah. attack the ongoing pandemic and how that relates to the organization of the health service and indeed the the, the lack of personnel at local level uh, over the last 10 years could you cope with those two yes, questions um, so just to make sure that everybody knows what contact tracing is, it's a, an essential um, part of public health and disease control in epidemics. So um, the UK has always had contact tracers, so sexually transmitted diseases and TB, where the idea is you're trying to, once you've identified a case who's got symptoms, 
You're trying to stop the spread and transmission of the disease and also identify other cases. Um, so what you're doing is you're interviewing the case to find out who they've been in contact with. The case goes into isolation and the contacts must go into quarantine. And the reason why you need to do this at local level is because you really need good local knowledge um, about the community, the extent to which they can actually adhere to isolation and quarantine, are their living conditions up to it? Do they need to be moved into hotels or other accommodation? Do they need special support? And also that way you can identify clusters of cases in households and you're trying to find out where the case might have started and um, the index case but also the spread of disease in a community the patterns of disease and ultimately you're trying to track the infection because you're trying to extinguish the virus you, you get a handle on it and that's your outbreak control measure that traditionally has always been done by either local health bodies when they were in health authorities but it really started off in local public um, local authorities uh, over a hundred years ago it started there and used to have medical offices of health until the 1973 reorganization of the NHS but we've always had a mechanism for local disease control um, and um, importantly um, you could have surge capacity i.e. if you didn't have enough contact tracers you would bring in volunteers or you would train them up and you would do it um, testing is important, it's a, an important support, but it's not the end of the world if you don't have it because you would do symptom monitoring. So you would monitor your contacts to see whether they develop symptoms. In some countries they give the contacts actually a community pack which will include a thermometer, an oxygen saturation meter, even a blood pressure measurement, uh, and then you would take them back in. Sorry, I'll just take this out. Um, and then you would take them back in. Um, sorry, can I phone you back later? I'm sorry, on another call. Sorry. Um, so, um, sorry, it's not stopping. Sorry, it doesn't want to stop. Um, so you would, uh, in some countries, you would, um, um, uh, so you take and you sterilize the kits. But clinical observation is really important. Of course, if you have testing, that's great. But the thing to remember about tests for COVID is they're not sensitive, i.e. many people who may be positive will actually test false negative. And that's really important to remember. So testing on its own is not enough. You must do, do the clinical observation, the symptom observation. And that's why the contact tracers should really be back in touch or the doctors or GPs or nurses every day um, just to see how people are and how they're doing. And that's essential. So we should have had that capacity, but we didn't. And extraordinarily, on the 12th of March, um, the government made a decision uh, through COBRA. Uh, its committee um, uh, decided, um, and we don't know why, to stop contact tracing. Chris Whitty and others have given two explanations. One, that contact tracing isn't, isn't particularly effective when the, because the epidemic by this time was raging. Um, that's not a good reason for stopping. Um, uh, but the other one is resource. They didn't have enough capacity. And it's quite extraordinary. They'd only traced 3,000 contacts of whom only 120 had tested positive by the time they had stopped it. Unfortunately, this decision appears to have been taken for the four nations, and this is a real problem that we've had the centralized top-down approach, because even then, in some parts of the country, there were almost no cases or very few cases. So what contact tracing could have done would, it, would have made, you wouldn't need necessarily have needed these huge national restrictions in every area. It might have been in some parts of the country you had no cases, so you could have had schools functioning, but you'd have put in all the other restrictions and you might have had a partial lockdown. But the government's been terrified about lifting lockdowns in different parts of the country, and that's inexplicable, because if you look at Germany, they've had great variation in their different states as to what they do. Um, but also now we're in a position where many parts of the country 
have either few cases or almost no cases. So you could again be thinking about lifting some of the local restrictions and actually putting in cordon sanitaire. Because we mustn't forget that the effects of the lockdown are really draconian and we're seeing a lot of excess deaths and disability. It would also have allowed some bits of the NHS to go back to functioning. I'm hearing alarming stories about the NHS hospitals are only at a third to half capacity, community mental health, the community health services, including mental health services, have basically stopped, apart from phone triage and videos. Um, and it's really, uh, we really have an accumulating number of people who are going to need urgent care. And so we're going to see excess deaths from people with cancer and cardiovascular uh, disease and stroke. So um, contact tracing is really important. The government's uh, carved out the local capacity because it took communicable disease control out of local authorities. And the 2012 Act put it into Public Health England. And local authorities, of course, have been decimated with budget cuts. And so their directors of public health have not been able to do this. But they have been willing and wanting to do it, but the government is refusing to do it. And the other big problem is that the data are not flowing locally. So directors of public health don't have real-time data on cases or on deaths. They're all going centrally to this new body, NHSX, plus the NHS from the NHS Business Service. Are you able to hear me? Um, but yes. it's a major, it's a major issue. Um, sorry, the data are not flowing. Um, my internet's unstable, it's saying, I'm sorry. Uh, so I don't know if you're hearing me or not. Um, no. But we, what we have now is the government. Yeah, sorry, Tony. I was going to say, we, 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 we are, we've heard the vast majority of it, but, but maybe we, we could just um, move on to see if anyone else wants to answer this question or go on to something else. But, that, that was that was very very helpful thank you very much and sorry uh, sorry i don't know what's coming and going but somebody actually it's good to do this <laughs> things you can't hear okay thank you um does anybody else want to pick up any any points on that issue before we go on to the next question okay um could i go on to the issue a, a little bit more on we've already touched on it but about outsourcing and privatization um there's several people have written in about this peggotty horton hill she's worried that the the public see the nhs logo everywhere and they don't understand sometimes that private companies are providing the services and she's asking how can the general public um, gain a raised awareness of what is actually happening. Now, that, that's a, 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 an important question. And then we have the escalation of outsourcing in, in these last several weeks of this pandemic. And, and John and others have referred to that. Stephen Cairns asks a specific question about pathology, pointing out uh, how uh, as I think Alison referred to, pathology testing has been centralised rather than using the capacity around the country in, in a creative sort of organic way. Uh, and he asks, does the panel think that these moves by the Department of Health are a prelude to mass privatisation of NHS pathology laboratories? Um, I, was, I was hoping that John might pick up these questions. And the last point connected to this area uh, several people again, but Diane Langford and Ken Kirk, Ken's from Sussex Defend the NHS, asked similar questions. Would it be reasonable to assume that when the government says it's going to put more funds into the NHS, there is, that there is no guarantee that this funding is going to frontline clinical care, but is more likely finding its way into the pockets of private corporations close to the government? Um, so, John, would you mind? I know you've covered some of this already, but would you mind picking yeah. up those questions? Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, I, on the uh, pathology centralisation, I mean, the, the, um, there was a, a, a move to set up a relatively small number of networks. I think it was um, less than 20 networks around the country. 
of pathology networks, the first couple of which that have gone to tender and have actually, or certainly the first one, major one in Lo South London and uh, the south, south of England, has actually been uh, handed to a private-led uh, consortium. And uh, the, the, clearly that was the intention behind the, the move because the way in which the uh, uh, tendering process has been put forward there uh, disadvantages NHS trusts that can't invest additional money up front and so forth. And, and clearly presumes that they're going to be turning to private sector partners. Um, I, I think the, the, the overall thing about, um, and the other thing that should be pointed out, Alison was talking about the uh, uh, tra tra tracking and, and tracing. Of course, the uh, uh, 18,000 are now being uh, recruited by, uh, again, private providers and have been, contractors have been brought in to recruit these people and, and run the system, which again is quite the opposite of the kind of locally based uh, local uh, authority-based uh, uh, system that Alison and others have been arguing for, and, and one which it, 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 uh, the private privatised sector is, is the least likely to be able to deliver an effective service because they themselves will lack that, that any kind of local knowledge uh, to, to deliver to, to deliver the results. But I also just think we should, uh, when it's talking about wholesale privatisation in the NHS, let's remember a very large percentage of the NHS is stuff that the private sector doesn't want to do because there's no profit in it. Let's not forget that. Let's not forget that all the frontline acute and emergency services in the main, the, certainly the emergency side and, and the complex cases uh, are, are, are those which the NHS has and which the private sector is poorly equipped. And although the NHS has bought up uh, large numbers of private hospital beds in order as part of their um, preparation uh, at a cost of up to three million uh, pounds a day uh, uh, estimated uh, uh, per, per, per bed uh, for the duration of the crisis. Uh, a lot of those are not being used because of course they require NHS uh, trained staff to actually uh, make them operate and, and they're not suitable at hospitals because they don't have any emergency departments, they're not actually geared up to, do, they don't have intensive care most of them either and they're, they're therefore only suitable for this smallest amount of uh, uh, smallest and least demanding uh, elective operations which of course have largely been paused during the COVID crisis whether or not again whether or not the, the, that makes sense given that we've now got 40 percent of NHS beds standing empty uh, while, while people are being denied the uh, the operations the scheduled operations uh, that, that is in, also including urgent elective operations in some cases are being postponed indefinitely a cancer case is cancelled in whole, ho uh, whole hospitals, trusts have cancelled cancer treatments and so forth as well. Whether or not that, uh, that actually makes any sense um, and has actually contributed to um, adequately dealing with the COVID crisis is a, a, de a debate we can no doubt have at, at a later point. But whether or not we need 10,000 uh, private beds as alongside uh, tens of thousands of NHS beds empty and un unused and these Nightingale hospitals, which have never been used and which are now being mothballed uh, or, or permanently closed, is, 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 is obviously a very valid question. And so I think the starting point for this government is, that, is you know, the private sector is the answer. What was the question? And at the, end, at the end of the day, we have to come back and say the private sector is definitely not the answer, however daft the question, because at the end of the day, they're not able to deliver what the NHS can deliver and they get in the way of the NHS delivering the things that only the public sector can deliver. And therefore, the sooner we can get the private sector stripped out, the better. Thank you very much. Can I ask any of the other panellists if they want to come in on this point? Nina, please do. Thanks. Uh, th thank you very much. I just, just want to respond to, I'm not sure who asked, asked the question, but to say that, that the answer is yes, a substantial amount of public funds are now going uh, into middleman pockets. The transactions, transactional costs of both the internal and the external market are high. And this of course means that the uh, public funds that should be going towards frontline care are progressively being withdrawn from frontline care, which is adding of course to the, the funding constraints suffered by the NHS. Uh, the second point is that people are very altruistic and people do have hearts of gold and you'll have seen lots of efforts um, around the country at people wanting to raise funds for the NHS and I would say to them please do raise funds for all the worthy charities that are out there 
but don't raise funds for the NHS because the NHS should be funded through public taxation. And the third point is if, yes, if our friends in the media could actually ask these sorts of questions and uh, respond with this sort of information, which would help inform the public of the extent to which the NHS has been fragmented and the extent to which public funds are increasingly being diverted into for-profit pockets, then perhaps the UK public would be able to raise a sufficient clamour as to help bring about some much needed change. Thank you, Tony. Thanks very much, Nina, that's great. Um, somebody's asked in the chat room, I'm, I'm trying not to lose my concentration, but uh, are there any campaigns against the marketization of the NHS? Um, I, I, can I just remind you that we are <laughs> the longest lasting and, na and biggest national campaign and it's called Keep Our NHS Public, and there's a clue there. We are absolutely campaigning against the marketization, the commercialization, whatever term you like to use, the privatization of the NHS, in addition to arguing for a, 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 a nationally united network that, that collaborates, that's coordinated, and that's properly funded and respects its staff. Uh, so, uh, whoever asked the question, please join Keep Our NHS Public uh, or support us in, in any other way. Um, could I go on to, to the next question and could I aim this at Nina, please? I know you've just spoken, but if you, if you don't mind, if you've drawn breath. This is from Felicity Dowling from the Save Liverpool Women's Hospital campaign. Um, uh, and she says, and the National Maternity Matters meeting. And she's, she's asking what the impact of the COVID-19 crisis is on maternal and child health, especially around, of course, around the perinatal period. How have maternity services fared in this crisis? Has the uh, sort of requisitioning of areas of the health service damaged the mother and child health pathway around maternity? Have wards been closed or, or uh, kept free from the virus? Um, has there been a reduction in staff? So are women at, at risk of having to give birth with a less qualified staff available to them or, or indeed left alone? And are there any thoughts that infant or maternal mortality has been damaged by this? So, so uh, you may want to add your thoughts on, on the overall issue about mother and child health, uh, which you're eloquent on. So please go ahead. Th th thanks, Tony. Thank you very much for, 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 for whoever raised that issue. So can I try and answer that in three different sections? Um, I think the first is to talk about the resilience of the National Health Service because of, uh, and, and, uh, and I'll come back to that. The second is about the data that we need to actually ask and then answer these, sort, these sorts of questions. And the, the third is a very general point that I want to make about stressors within, within society and their impact on, on mother and child health. So let me take the first, first one first, which is resilience. Now we know that uh, in around about December 2019, just as the COVID ep epidemic struck, the NHS was probably in a, a pretty much the most fragile situation it, had, it, has, it has been in. It's been suffering years of austerity. Um, we had a waiting list uh, that was about four and a half million. We had 100,000 empty, um, empty posts. Um, we had the enormous debacle of Brexit and the damage caused by Brexit over the, the preceding two years. So the NHS was not resilient. And I'll remind you all that what the cornerstones of resilience are. They're a, a very good workforce, a strong workforce, a very sound infrastructure, a really demonstrable, measurable quality of care and public trust. Now, the public does, I think, still trust the NHS. But if you think of those other three of the four pillars, they were not where, where they should have been. So we went into this crisis in a very weakened position, not a good way to go into it. Now, whenever you, that brings me to the second point, which is whenever you have a large societal stressor, or a crisis, a global crisis. And you can go back in history to think of the, what scientists always refer to, which is the Dutch famine 
1945, but more recent ones too, such as the Chilean um, uh, earthquake and, and other major global crises. When epidemiologists study the impact on mother and child health and on uh, perinatal outcomes, on newborn outcomes, you will always find evidence of um, the impact of the stressor on newborn health. And uh, as a neonatologist and as a researcher, I can emphatically say that there is now absolute cast iron evidence showing the causal link from poor maternal health, poor health during pregnancy, uh, poor health in the newborn period to poor health throughout the, 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 the life course. Uh, a poor experience early in development will make you much, much more vulnerable as an adult to all sorts of chronic non-communicable diseases. So, um, and if you add to that the impact of widening inequality, which has been referred to again and again and again, which is also going to adversely impact mother and baby outcomes, you can see that this crisis is not only affecting the health of the nation now, but will continue to affect the health of the nation for many, many, many years but of course we know enough from science to mitigate against this, but we are not doing that. And because time is short, let me run quickly then into the third point I'd like to make. And that is that one really does need to um, record the data, capture the data and analyze the data in ways that are trustworthy and meaningful. And again, as a scientist, I would say, there are recognized routes to publishing data that is trustworthy and meaningful. But it is, it is absolutely wrong to suggest to the public that there is always an answer. The truthful course is to say, we don't know or we don't know enough, but we're jolly well doing our utmost to actually gather together that evidence and get correct answers. And one of the adverse impacts of the fragmentation across the different sections of the health service is that it has become increasingly more and more difficult to actually gather together these data. So therein we have another problem when we try and actually get the evidence. And the final point I would make in relation to evidence is that one of the ways in which neonatal services, maternity services, and, and I guess across the healthcare um, have suffered is that there's been a great paucity of knowledge about what precisely should be done. So for example, um, what PPE equipment should be used, uh, what constitutes an aerosol ge generating procedure, um, when we should actually provide full PPE as opposed to partial PPE. And this too has led to great confusion and great inconsistency. So going forward, I hope we are recording the data. Many groups are trying to do so consistently. And I do think the, the UK has got a great record of sharing data. I think we can be proud of that. And I hope that out of this crisis, we will actually acquire a lot more information, which will help us should we hit a subsequent wave of COVID-19 and indeed in any other future crisis that comes at, comes at us out of the blue. I'll, I will stop there, Tony, but, but thanks very much to whoever raised that question. Thank you very much. It was, it was from the Save Liverpool Women's Hospital campaign, Felicity. Um, could I target Sonia for the next question, please? <laughs> um, one of the most troubling things that escalated in the last few days or a couple of weeks has been the it seems explicit pressure on staff not to speak out um, and pressure that they they may indeed be uh, acted against if they do so um, so could you could you give some comments about how yourself and other and other people navigate that tricky area about needing to speak the truth from very very important personal experience and a related but different question how, how do you feel as a frontline doctor who i know you've been doing long shifts night and day i've seen you looking exhausted <laughs> um, how do you feel when you see politicians on the one hand and the public on the other hand clapping the nhs uh, every week Okay. Um, so I think, you know, as you mentioned, I think it's been um, uncomfortable and concerning the trying to um, undermine and silence healthcare workers that have been speaking out about their concerns around protective equipment. Um, and it's not just about during this period, but I think, you know, generally 
we need to have a culture in the NHS and in wider workforce where people are able to feel that they can speak out um, when they have concerns. And I think, you know, we have to learn the lessons from the past, actually, when there's been when there's been big issues around patient safety and care being compromised. A big factor in that is 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 workers and NHS staff not being able to speak out. And I'm worried about the implication that this will have on the long term and the culture in the NHS um, creating this culture of, 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 of healthcare workers feeling, feeling silenced and feeling that they are unable to raise concerns openly. Um, I think, and also, you know, just going on from that, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about doctors, um, particularly um, why is it that we have so many um, black and ethnic minority doctors who have died from this virus. Now, there's lots of factors underlying that, um, but something that has been raised and I think needs to be acknowledged is um, prior to this virus, we know that black and ethnic minority doctors were half, much less likely to be able to raise, felt able to raise concerns about bullying or workplace safety in the workplace. Um, and then just during this virus, I know and, um, anecdotally and from, from some surveys that have been done over the past few weeks that we know that um, black and ethnic minority doctors and nurses um, have felt pressured to work in situations where they have been put at risk and they haven't had adequate equipment. I've actually had two colleagues of mine, um, well, two friends of mine contact me in the past few weeks, both of them quite similar stories in that they were failed the fitting test, so the, the mask that they had were not fitted adequately to their face and so essentially they were not optimally protected um, both of them raised their concerns with their seniors and both of them were pressured to continue to work um, amongst ventilated patients so in high risk settings putting their health at risk so, so I think this is something that we do need to acknowledge um, and I think the the attempt to um, silence healthcare workers by you know, within the NHS and, and amongst politicians is, is really concerning for workers and patient safety in the current crisis and also going forward. Um, with regards to your clapping, the clapping, the, um, the weekly clapping, you know, I'm in, I'm in two minds about it, to be honest. So um, it does raise morale amongst healthcare workers when the, when the public clap. Um, my mum every week sends me a video of her in the street clapping and it, and it is really heartwarming. Um, but I guess there is a, a, a discomfort and I guess the sort of a hypocrisy when we, do, when we see our politicians clapping. And I think we do need to bear in mind that um, many of our workers in our NHS, and I'm talking about you know, our care workers as well, but our porters, our cleaners, our catering staff, um, many of them, as we mentioned, are, are outsourced, are undervalued, on low paid, um, insecure contracts, don't have financial security, don't have job security. Um, so I think for many, you know, a clap is great, but it may seem just, I guess, insufficient um, appreciation. I think there's more that can be done to show adequate appreciation to these staff. And I think, you know, clap and badges are not quite adequate. Um, was there a third question? No. No, okay. <laughs> a third question's coming down the line. Right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go on to a, a related area, but much, much wider, which is about the impact of the crisis on the black and minority ethnic community as a whole. Uh, and of course, that overlaps with, but it is different from poverty uh, uh, and other pressures, uh, the impact of, of racism itself. Um, Several people have, have written in about this, and I'm going to ask anybody to, to come up with an answer on this. Um, but the prelude, some of the background is um, from Greg Dropkin's question. He, he's saying that in a public health sense, uh, COVID-19 doesn't um, respect class or boundaries. In, in one sense, anybody can be infected. We know some are more vulnerable than others, but um, do, do, do we agree that an effective programme of contact tracing requires an immediate end to the hostile environment and the exclusion of some 600,000 people, 1% of the population from free NHS healthcare? 
And I would say in brackets, we, we do know that coronavirus is a notifiable disease, uh, that uh, everybody can get assessment and treatment for that, but the hostile environment has taught people to be fearful of going near the NHS. So that was his question. And related to that, from Carol Saunders uh, in Ta Tower Hamlets, Keeper NHS Public, um, it, she's pointing out the absolute link between poverty and uh, a minority ethnic community and high death rates. And Newham, Newham in East London has the highest death rate per 100,000 of the population in the country at 144.3 people per 100,000. Um, in other areas, it's in single figures or it's in the dozens, uh, way, way much below. Her questions are, given where we are now, can anything still be done to protect these at-risk groups? And secondly, can campaigners in the worst hit areas what, they, what can they do to make the biggest impact about this issue? So th there's a, a question that has a, um, a, a political flavor from Greg about um, how can we end the hostile environment? And from Carol, a question about how can at-risk groups be protected? And then what can campaigners do about it? So that's... A package. Does anybody want to tackle that pack package for me? So, Sonia, please do go ahead, and then John. And um, I hope Alison might have heard some of that as well. So, uh, Sonia, thank you very much. Go ahead. Okay. Right. Lots of questions there. Um, so, I'll start with the why we're seeing disproportionate deaths among um, BME and people of colour. Um, there were lots, lots of factors underlying this. Um, health inequality and the, I guess, the health inequality between racialized groups mirrors the social and economic inequalities that we see between racialized groups. So we know that um, in this country that black and um, ethnic minority groups, um, many of them are more likely to live in poor quality housing, um, less likely to have access to open space. Um, over-reliant on insecure work and actually over-reliant on many of the jobs such as the care sector and key workers that we see right now and um, some ethnic minority groups um, are more likely to be in poverty as well so there's those social and economic factors um, we need to as i said institutional racism within the nhs is likely to have an impact on why we're seeing disproportionate deaths um, among bme staff as well um, and then I think there's, you know, the, the, it is a complicated issue. And if we look at, um, and, and, and premature deaths among BME people and people of color is something that we've seen in other areas of healthcare. So if you look at maternal mortality, for example, black women are five times more likely to die in childbirth than white women. Um, if we look at mental health, um, a black man is four times more likely to be sectioned than a white man. Um, so we do need to be um, thinking about um, structural racism within our healthcare system. And then some of the factors that have come out when looking into the, the factors why we see these disparities, um, is, and particularly with maternal health care, is women and black women symptoms not being taken um, seriously by healthcare professionals. So that's something we need, to, as healthcare professionals, need to be acknowledging and considering. Um, and then I think this can also linking on to your question about you know the hostile environment and so the government what the government have said is that um that people everyone including undocumented migrants can be treated and tested for coronavirus um but they haven't done an end to the hostile environment they haven't done an end to data sharing so we still have a situation where you have undocumented migrants still feel um fear going to the hospital fear seeking health care when they become unwell um, and we know that we already have had deaths of migrants because of that. Um, and also, uh, something else to mention, it's not just about healthcare, the hostile environment um, impacts many other aspects. Um, so we've got the situation currently where undocumented migrants don't have access to public funds, um, so don't have access to the welfare support like the rest of us have. So we've got the situation currently where you have many undocumented migrants having to continue to work 
um, and are not able to do the social distancing um, because essentially if they don't work they'll be ending up destitute. So the things that the government can do now, they can end the hostile environment right now. Um, other countries have done this, Portugal has done this, um, and other countries across the world have done this. Um, so they can end the hostile environment, they can, they can um, ensure that everyone has access to public funds, so everyone is able to um, have access to healthcare, have access to welfare support, and no one ends up on the streets as a result of this pandemic. Um, and there's something that came up actually last week about the government's right to rent policy. And again, this is something that, you know, it's a, um, when we're thinking about why is it that black and ethnic minorities um, are more likely to live in poor quality housing, why is it that black ethnic minorities take some twice as long to rent a house than white British people in this country? We have a policy in this country with the right to rent housing where landlords have to check immigration status off um, of renters and we know that this has caused racial discrimination and this was ended up in the courts two weeks ago um, and yeah it, we didn't win so the government were quite happy that this didn't win so the government there's policies right now that the government are supporting which are um, making this problem worse around racial disparities so there's a lot that can be done right now um, but then there's a lot that needs to be done over the next few years to try and unpick this inequality and the structure and the quality that has been present now for many years in this country. So that's a very wind, very rambling answer, but there's a lot to Thank say. Thank very in much. Well, I, I put a lot into the question. John, John, you were going to... Oh, and can I just remind Nina and Alison, I, I don't know whether you want to speak because I can't see you. So if you do want to speak, uh, reveal yourselves. But um, uh, John, you wanted to speak. Yeah, just, just briefly, because uh, I, I think it's interesting to see even the ghastly Pretty Patel has actually recognised that... Uh, uh, the immigration bill that she was trying to push through has had to be postponed on the basis that uh, clearly it's, they, they don't want to they don't want to be putting obstacles in the way of recruiting additional staff from overseas to help the NHS at this point. Uh, visas are being extended for people that are due to run out at the end at the end of this year. The, the, this is from the, probably the most overtly sort of hostile person in the Tory government to uh, to, to migrants, uh, which is a bit ironic given it's Pretty Patel. But uh, uh, th so uh, I, I think I think that the situation is forcing an exposure of what the consequences are. And there's even a discussion has been raised. I, I, I'm not sure how far it will go about actually uh, suspending or even uh, scrapping some of the charges on, on, on migrant workers who work in the NHS, who obviously have to pay to use the NHS, the so-called immigration surcharge which the Tory government um, manifesto last uh, uh, December um, um, uh, uh, proposed to increase to £625 a year from £400. Uh, so these penalties are, 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 are actually working against the NHS and even the government in its current circumstances being forced de facto to recognise that. So I think we just need to actually keep banging that point. And, and you know, there are some things which I think are being forced on the government at the moment that we can actually say, look, why do you want to put it back to what it was? Because it clearly is, is working again. And I think there would be so little political um, uh, advantage for the government in proceeding down such a contradictory road that we, we might even win. So it's certainly, but I think the other thing is we need to start to get the unions who, who are actually all have formerly quite good policies on this to take this up in a much more active way and actually work in the, in, the, in the hospitals and outwards. Look, if you like what we're doing, you're applauding for us every week. You know, a load of us are, are, are from overseas. Um, and and, and if, if, you, if you think the hostile environment policy is a good thing, you know, you, you're, you're crazy. And let, let's actually have a campaign to get the government to drop these policies and, and scrap the whole apparatus of the hostile environment. And I, I do think the unions talk a good talk on this. They need to get out and, and walk a good walk on it as well. Thank you very much. And just on, on John's uh, last but one point there, there is of course a huge campaign on, on uh, to, to, to end migrant charges and the hostile environment. And that's led by people like Docs Not Cops and Med Act and, and uh, Maternity Action and uh, Migrants, um, Migrant Voice and so on. And we, we are working with them to, to the best of our resources. Um, but it reminds me that, there, again, there are a couple of comments in the stream of, of, of uh, 
of the chat room, uh, what can we do about it and how can we organize a, a good response? And to, at the end, towards the end of this meeting, I, I would like us to start thinking about what we might do in terms of positive actions uh, and there are, there are some underway so we're, we're not we're not starting from scratch so remind us what we are doing and people can how how can people join in uh, we for example have a, a, a six demand petition that, that that includes the demand about ending migrant charges uh, that includes uh, access to PPE uh, that, that points to the risks of zero hour contracts and outsourcing uh, so there are a number of things at the end i'd like us to come back to um was anybody else wanting to come in on this point because otherwise then um oh, nina sorry i nearly missed you nina that's all right very quick point just to follow on from some of the the chat that's been going on some of the comments that we made i absolutely agree with those folk who've been suggesting that actually the uh, clap for clap for carers the 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 eight o'clock clap should be hijacked to actually uh, be, because people do feel warmly about the nhs but i think as as we've discussed this evening they may not be aware that it's the nhs is not the nhs that it should be um and i i agree with sonia i too feel very ambivalent about the the uh, the eight the eight o'clock clap because it is wonderful to have this recognition, but on the other hand, I think it's also really important that the UK public know what they're clapping for and what I'm sure if they were aware of this conversation and realised that the health service that they hold so dearly is not the health service that they think it is, they would probably clap much, much, much harder. So if there's anything that can be done to, to, to hijack that clap, and raise awareness of what people are really, really clapping for in their hearts of hearts. Wouldn't that be a wonderful idea? Thank you very much. And, and some of us have done that around the country. We've had our demand, not, not just to go out and clap, but our demands for PPE and for testing. Um, uh, and um, we've had even a couple of megaphones have emerged to give our messages to our neighbors on such occasions. It has to be done sensitively, but it's absolutely possible and, and, and people really respond to that very well. Now, uh, can I just run through what, what's left on my own agenda? Um, I was going to touch on the, well, not touch on, cover the issue of social care with you. Um, we won't have enough time to go into this next issue, but I do want to discuss mental health issues uh, to some extent. Uh, we haven't got a specialist in that, but I'm sure we've got a lot of expertise. The, the issue of um, rehabilitation or reablement, uh, um, so, somebody has asked, and I just wanted to touch on that. Uh, <laughs> One of the, as John said, it's a dead white elephant, but the Nightingale hospitals are creating, what was it, 30,000 beds, are, are creating a cover story for, for what was not existing in the NHS. But I think the NHS staff realised that the government wasn't going to respond quickly enough and they organised their services locally. I know this from personal experience. They, they cancelled certain... Uh, relatively less urgent services. They re completely reorganized the hospitals in a, in a startlingly wonderful way in many ways, and they actually didn't need the Nightingale hospitals. What would have happened if we'd had 17,000 extra beds in place, 10,000 extra intensive care beds, the 100,000 missing staff, and you know uh, hospital and community therapy teams that could re rehabilitate people uh, we would have been in a far far better state and that plus contract tracing i think would have saved poss possibly tens of thousands of lives so sorry that was a bit of a speech i didn't mean i didn't mean to, to do that um and then the last thing was to end up on where next so on social care, there's a, a question sent in from Pam Richards. Um, 
The underfunding of social care and its fragmented delivery and organisation has resulted in huge numbers of unnecessary deaths of service users and care staff. It has also highlighted how much social care is the poor relation in our health and care system. Would you agree that it, would, that it should now be a priority to establish a properly funded national care service, which is free at the point of delivery? This will ensure true integration between health and social care with no barriers caused by charging an eligibility criteria. So I'm going to ask for your comments there. C can I just put in one comment of my own, which is that, that in the campaigning world on health and social care, there, uh, there is unanimity that social care, personal social care should be provided free at the point of use uh, and we should move that to the same basis of the, as the health service there's a difference of opinion about whether it should be social care within the health service or as a national care service where they're separate organizations but they coordinate and they integrate delivery of care to patients and um, so i just want people to be aware of that when we're talking about it that, that there may be agreement in the, the the main content of that demand but differences to be sorted out about how it's enacted would anybody like to talk to the issue of social care and the the tragedy that we're seeing the disgrace that we're seeing up and down the country um i've got john and then allison so john first and then allison uh, unmute yourself sorry john you're unusually quiet you're, you've muted again just unmute yourself. That's it. Right. Got it. Okay. I, I was misreading. I was reading it the wrong way around. Um, yeah. I, I, I just want to uh, just remind people who are uh, maybe not aware, actually, that uh, before 1988, and the Griffiths report uh, came up with a great idea of privatising um, social care. A lot of it was actually in the public sector, and it was actually then uh, a whole process of, and particularly domiciliary care. Uh, home care services, which we haven't talked about that much, which are also affected by a, a lack of PPE and lack of resources, and of course zero hours contracts and uh, staff uh, being allocated 15 minutes at a time to actually deal with uh, with patients with complex needs and so forth. Um, but we did have a home help service, which was run by, through local government, which was extremely effective and uh, and a very popular one that actually provided continuity of care. Uh, for some of the people in, in their own homes and, and we had a local government care homes were actually provided although not nursing homes so much um, and it was a, a conscious decision to uh, switch to a system which took it out of the NHS closed down the long-term uh, and, and uh, the, the longest stay um, beds for older people specialist beds for older people in NHS hospitals and effectively forced that into the private sector um, uh, uh, over that period and uh, large numbers of beds closed if you look at the bed closures over the last uh, 30 40 years a large proportion of those are elderly care beds that have disappeared completely and are lumped lumped together now in general and acute beds so we have had a public service provision in in that area before and clearly we need to extend it it's clear that a lot of these care homes are not viable financially as businesses they are but they but, but they, they the existence of them as businesses prevents any kind of unification or integration of those services either together as a care service which is coherent or with the nhs uh, to work more efficiently in the in in, in integrating with, uh, with with healthcare itself and um, when we lump that in with the uh, use of the emergency legislation to discharge patients who had not been tested or actually known to be COVID positive into care homes who are not equipped to deal with them. You've got a formula for actually slaughtering large numbers of older people. And it's just an absolute outrage that has gone on. And we're, we're, even the local government, or the local government association, uh, the care homes associations themselves have been protesting about the fact this is just not a viable way to proceed. And we can wind up in the next few weeks with a large number of these smaller care homes in particular going bust and actually triggering a new crisis in which people are either catapulted back into hospitals or, or left completely destitute by, by those closures. This is a completely irrational system and any, no government can have a political um, uh, advantage in maintaining the system the way it is. The care homes themselves are not powerful 
enough political lobby to actually keep it that way if a government came along with any kind of serious intention to change it. So the government which claimed they had an oven ready um, uh, social care system, uh, a solution to the social care problems, and which was Boris Johnson's famous phrase, it doesn't seem to quite understand what oven ready really is. And we haven't seen the scheme but they do need to get involved and actually do something about this. Uh, uh, since they're the government in charge, it's on their watch, this is actually happening. And, uh, and, and you know, they need to put right what Thatcher did so wrong um, back in 1988 and reverse that process. Otherwise, they're gonna have a major collapse on their hands. And bear in mind, the average age of the Conservative Party is extremely old in terms of membership. The average age of their voters is extremely high. Large numbers of people would not take kindly to a government that actually presides over the mass uh, destruction of the lives of thousands of older people. So I do think we need to be banging that point home politically and actually pile pressure on this government and obviously a future government to actually re reintegrate the service back into the public sector. Thank you, John. Alison, you, you were wanting to speak. Oh, good, you're, you're there. Uh, um, hi, uh, Sonia, can you turn off your for your video as well, because I think it interferes with the internet until, yeah, great. Um, I think uh, I just wanted to say I, I agree with John. Um, my view, uh, for what it's worth, where I'm coming from, and I'll explain why, is that um, I think it's unfortunate to keep a separate national care service from a national health service, because if you start from the principle that care is a continuum, then one flows into the other. And of course then, if you had a national health and social care service, you'd want to have heavy devolution. So you had a lot of local control and community involvement and community decision-making into the shape of what an, a local care service would look like. But a national care service would take staff under national terms and conditions. It would give them training opportunities. It would allow you to redeploy staff. Um, and um, the other point that I want to make is that, uh, as John rightly says, most of the beds, there are 400,000 beds now, in, um, in uh, there are 400,000 beds now in care homes, the residential sector, but most of these um, were actually in, um, in the NHS previously. Um, so I don't see what the big deal is about making a national health and uh, care social care service and another reason is that what happened in 1988 to 90 is the geriatricians abandoned that service but so did all the community health services if anybody goes into a nursing home they know it's virtually impossible to get a physio a speech therapist an occupational therapist even mental health support um, and it's totally inadequate the provision there are insufficient registered nurses because it's seen as a second-rate specialty. Whereas if you made it part of the health service, it would be seen as a first-rate specialty because you'd have medical students, uh, you'd have all the nurses, you'd have everybody rotating through one of the most important uh, areas and not just into um, nursing homes, but also into community social care as well. What more valuable experience can people have? So I would advocate um, that we do need legislation for a national health and social care system. It needs to be thought about very carefully so we can give local communities local control. And also we need to think about warden control, uh, warden controlled housing and sheltered housing as part of that as well. So that people have a, a range of very flexible options. And after all, we're going to have quite a few million people who are currently furloughed, who are unemployed. And so this could be part of a wonderful rejuvenation and strategy for the many millions of people who are going to be um, uh, leaving employment to have a really good um, economic industrial strategy, which is built on rebuilding public services. Okay, th thank you very much, Alison. Um, uh, on the, on the uh, on the content of delivering um, integrated care to people that do need health and social care. I, th I think, you know, I I've always wanted that kind of in integrated care service. What we, what we 
haven't really considered here, and there isn't anybody with a disability uh, uh, as, as a spokesperson on this, uh, on this panel, is that there are many people who don't regard themselves as ill or in need of the health service, but they do need uh, help with their independence and they, they need uh, a, a care service that helps them maintain their independence. And, and they worry about the swallowing up of social care into the, into the, uh, the need of an acute health service. So there's an argument there, but that's for another day in my view. And, and I think uh, the content of what Alison's arguing for is, is something that I've worked for myself. But I want to touch now, again, we, we don't have a, a spokesperson about mental health, although uh, Pam may have something to say, but I'm just going to read out uh, a question from Tom Griffiths, uh, who's the Secretary of the Mental Health Charter Alliance. And he says about mental health, what more can and should be done to support mental health service users and their carers who are feeling isolated or trapped at home and no longer receiving adequate support from either the, the local NHS trust or their GP. And um, I'm not going to read this out fully, but Elaine Di Campo also asked about, uh, in essence, the need to reinstate community-based uh, support for people with mental health additional needs to help them break away from isolation and, uh, and address their vulnerability. Does anybody want to address the huge issues about mental health thrown up in this COVID pandemic crisis? And Pam, thank you very much. I've got your hand. And those of you that have, uh, what's the word, M muted your video, I can't see you if you want to speak. So just remember that. Pam, please go ahead, unmute yourself, Pam, if you can, or uh, or, or if, if uh, mm -hmm. done. Thank you. Okay. Uh, mental health services have been dramatically cut. I worked in the NHS in mental health and I just saw cuts, a ridiculous amount. It's, they always have been the Cinderella of funding and it's led to widespread increase in self-harm, more suicides. I do deal with it a bit in the film where we've used some certain case examples of a suicide and somebody who wanted care. And also people are sent miles away from their homes or any kind of connection to family. It's really not acceptable. But I would say with the coronavirus, we're going to be left with a traumatized society and a traumatized NHS workforce, which was already buckling under the strain. So I think that we, we really, really do need to get more funding for mental health services, for community funding. All those things were cut. That's basically what I want to say. We really do need to campaign for funding in this area because mental health is so important. And with the poverty and the deaths and what people have had to witness and their own fears. And there's no real help in this regard. Thank you. Thanks very much, Pam. I've got Sonia and then John. Yeah, sorry, I cut out, so I didn't hear the first part of Pam's answer. Um, but I, I completely agree with the question. Actually, it was my job when I was a junior doctor in my F2 years, it was working in a mental health hospital, which is what led me to become political about the NHS, um, because I just thought the level of the care was appalling. Um, and I think actually for too many years in this country, our mental health services have been um, quite grossly underfunded. Um, and actually prior to, at the start of February, I changed jobs. Um, so I just, I'd been working in an a &E department over the winter and February I started working in mental health. I only did it for a few weeks because then I got redeployed back to the COVID ward. Um, but I was quite shocked about what I, what I heard in our induction in that we had, um, we were told that people living within our locality were in hospitals as far away as Yorkshire because there were no beds locally. Um, and I just was, it's, it's, it's grotesque how bad it's got, I think, um, our mental health services in this country. Um, and then also I think a point that was touched on earlier about the NHS has managed to cope in the past few weeks with the number of cases coming in with COVID virus by 
downscaling and closing down community services and mental health has been particularly affected by that. So I was working in a, in, a, in a community mental health service and we've completely had to downscale. We've lost half of our staff, we've had to go to work in inpatient units. So community mental health services have really suffered over the past few weeks. Um, and of course we know the conditions of the pandemic, the lockdown, the social isolation, the uncertainty, you know, the, 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 you know, the deaths and the misery that we see, um, it's gonna cause real issues. And I, I'm, I'm very concerned that we have a, a looming mental health crisis here. Um, if, if we don't have action now to address that. And that's about increasing capacity of mental health services. Um, and that needs to be done really quickly and dramatic and rapidly to, to try and limit um, the harm caused by that. Thank you very much, Sonia. Um, John, and then we're going to move on to, to the last section and then the announcements. John. Just, just very briefly, I mean, the Health Service Journal has got a, a piece at the moment to say the um, mental health trusts have braced for a spike in, uh, in demand of acutely ill people who have only been basically given a minimal kind of telephone and digital consultations over the last few weeks because of the, uh, of the uh, lockdown. Um, and clearly, you know, like so many other physical conditions that people have been so sort of ha having to hold back on because there's no possibility of accessing treatment, um, mental health is, is obviously continuing to deteriorate for, for, for people who do need that continuing support. And, and this is a, a major problem. It's also a big area of privatization, massive area of privatization uh, within, within the uh, NHS provision. And you know, so again, we're looking at the private sector coining coining it in on guaranteed funding from the NHS for patients who really need a much more integrated and and civilized publicly provided service. And uh, you know, we've actually got private hospitals that are gaining out money out of keeping people longer in hospital because they get paid by the by the day or by the night for actually caring for them. Uh, and, 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 and this is, just makes no sense at all economically, organisationally, or in any possible way, other than simply lying in the pockets of, of, of private providers. Okay, thank you very much, John. Uh, Sonia, I was, oh, sorry, I was just going to ask you something. Go ahead, Sonia. And just one more thing, I'm not sure this was mentioned, but in the past couple of weeks, it's been revealed, this, you know, the scandal in our care homes, with um, neglect and the number of deaths that they've had and the fact that the carers working there hadn't had adequate equipment. Um, and I do think that there just needs to be some scrutiny about what's happening in our mental health inpatient units as well, um, uh, with regards to equipment to staff, but also um, patients in mental health units um, who there have been cases of coronavirus and, and people have died. And I think there does need to be more scrutiny about that and um, more accountability there as well. Thank you. And uh, community mental health workers have, have died. And, and the, yeah. the, the, what, what is defined as a key worker in need of protection in the course of their work is, is no longer um, A&E and intensive care. It, it's actually all sorts of realities when you're dealing with a, a deadly pandemic where people are looking after vulnerable people in their homes. Uh, on park benches or wherever they are looking at going out to find them and make sure that their mental health is, is supported and they may need PPE. Um, there was a question that's just gone floated by um, asking Sonia if you have any other comments on how what action might be proposed or taken to support NHS staff of black and minority ethnic background uh, and of course uh, Nina or, or anybody else on the panel may also want to come in. Sonia do you have anything? A, yeah a, I think a, I guess a, just you know the simple basics having um, adequate protection and optimal protection um, and with regards to this discussions about you know the, the protective equipment the concerns have come there's two concerns firstly shortages and not having enough um, particularly in community services. But I think there's also been concerns that um, our guidelines with what, what is optimal protection differ from the World Health Organization and from some European countries as well. Um, and 
So for example, you know, I'm working on a COVID ward and we're told that adequate protection is a surgical mask um, and there's gaps there, it's not put to your face um, and an apron that's not covering your body. So there's people that feel that this protection doesn't feel to be um, optimal. Um, and I'm, what we've been calling for is some honesty about, you know, if these guidelines have been based on what level of, of, the, of not having enough protection and, and how best to ration it, um, then that needs to be honest and then we can make adjustments within the workplace to you know for example on my own ward we can say who is less risk who does more close contact with patients and who is more risk and you could you know people staff that are older bme staff those that have health conditions maybe do less less close contact with patients and we can make those adjustments adjustments to protect staff um, and then something else as well particularly about bme workers um, you know, we forget, we always think about, you know, doctors and nurses, but as I said earlier, you know, many of our workers in our NHS, catering staff, porters, cleaners, carers, um, are particularly where I work in London, predominantly BME actually, um, and many of them don't, are, don't have the security of work that I do. Um, so they don't, if they were felt that they were not able to work, if they felt they were at risk, um, if they were there is less security there and they are unable to take leave like as, as I would do um, and they have less job security there because of the nature of their contracts and there's not been enough done I feel from the government to ensure that they have that job security um, if they feel that they are at risk and they need to step away from the front line. Thank you very much Sonia. Now could oh, uh, Nina last comment please and then I'm going to ask you all to make some comments about what we can do what you might propose that we all do next in campaigning. So Nina, uh, sorry, on, the, on, this, on this issue. But very, very quickly, to, very quickly, Tony, and that is that I'd say that, that my view is that anyone who is in a precarious, you know, high risk situation should be adequately protected. Many of you will have seen the data from the Health Services Journal today suggesting that young women um, who are healthcare workers are dying at twice the rate that you would anticipate them to be. So I think that, that, that yes, clearly there's been a large number of deaths among black and minority e e ethnic healthcare workers. And yes, one needs to get to the bottom of why that, that should be. But there are lots of factors that contribute to risk. And I, I, and I think that uh, the, the, the correct response um, should be for all healthcare workers who are working in high risk situations to be adequately protected. Because once we try and compartmentalize them up or divvy them up, inevitably you're going to miss someone who actually does require that same degree of, of protection. So let's, uh, let's gather the evidence and let's make a rational judgment. But for the moment, let's make sure that we do our utmost to argue for proper protection for everyone who is in a high, high risk situation. Right, thank you very much. If it's possible, I'm going to ask you all to in our last 15 minutes to have one minute each where you uh, c c say things that, that, that the audience, uh, which is still several hundred people, would learn from uh, or get ideas from, and, and they've got loads of ideas by the way, but uh, what we should be saying, demanding, campaigning on. So if you've got any thoughts on, for, ca for campaigning for ourselves and for those listening, uh, one minute each and then uh, there's a lot of announcements including things that other people can do that that we want to get through before we close um, so would anybody like to start or should i just go around my my clockwork pictures it, if nobody wants to start i'm going to start with john and then go to alison nina sonia and pam so john first please I think we have to uh, bite the bullet and recognise that we need to be campaigning to force changes on a Tory government rather than waiting for another election, which is could be five years away. And I think we need to be start looking at ways in which we can build on what has happened that we can actually use as a progressive step in the uh, in the changes uh, to meet the COVID uh, epidemic and persuade government not to revert to what they had before but to go forward from where we are and i think we need to show them uh, by by the building as much of a lobby that we can that, that in fact this would actually be in their political interests and in fact it would actually be i the reality is if we just wait for labor to do this that who knows when that will be 
and at the present time the Labour leadership doesn't appear to be wanting to challenge the government. We need to find ways of challenging the government in a way that is getting them to do things that they see as in their own interests, but in fact also move towards reversing the Health and Social Care Act, bringing the NHS back into a, 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 a single integrated system uh, and, and obviously tackling the care crisis. So it's a big challenge. A lot of people don't like thinking that way, but I think we're going to have to. Thank you very much, John. Um, Alison, are you up for a, a one minute sure. challenge to everybody? Uh, thank you. And thank you for all the great questions that people have put in the chat. I'm sorry if we haven't addressed or answered them. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, first of all, with a lot lot of who have died and should not have died so their deaths not be in vain so I think really making a big case about the excess deaths both from COVID in nursing homes but non-COVID these deaths should not be in vain um, mm. and remember the reason why they died was because of extraordinary government delay for two months and the lack of capacity in the health service to deal with patients and cases and resulted in the lockdown. So I think the second thing is that you, we should be arguing to go local for contact tracing, for testing, and against the centralization and privatization of the apps and the testing and the contact tracing for Serco. Really, we need to be arguing for building up local public health departments. But we also need to be demanding an opening up of all these contracts. I don't know or not, but I've heard there's not very much tendering being going on, but a lot of money being thrown at the private sector. That includes to local authorities, into, so, into social care and nursing homes, but it also includes the Nightingale, the PPE, the ventilators that didn't work, the testing um, samples that didn't work for three million from China. We really need to demand that all these contracts are opened up and, we, um, and that means really a lot of FOIs and parliamentary questions to put big pressure. We also need to expose the companies that are involved. And finally, um, just to say I completely agree with John, I think we should see legislation in the short term as being possible and having a political movement to reinstate our NHS in England and to reintegrate uh, social care and we should really be working for a bill for the autumn and putting enormous pressure uh, on, on as much as labour because what this does is reveal 20 or 30 years of cumulative ineptitude under all administrations actually um, but a part, of course under the previous uh, Conservative uh, and the coalition government when it comes to the austerity period. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, Alison. Um, Nina, are you okay to come in next? Yes, thank you. So the, the only things I'd like to conclude with is to say, first of all, that, that health is not a commodity um, and health care is not a business. Um, and and I, I would really like to see those two clarion calls transmitted out there to the public. I'd also like the public to actually, all of us to help the public appreciate to a greater extent that if you have a parallel or even a progressing um, parallel private healthcare system, you will progressively destabilize the public healthcare system. And I think that that point is not sufficiently appre appreciated. So if we really want the magnificent NHS that we all, we all love and we all feel is absolutely for this country, then we really do have to keep the private healthcare sector well and truly in its box. Thank you very much. Amen to that. Um, <laughs> Sonia, do you have... A, a yeah. Um, to be honest, I find this a bit disheartening because my demands are going to be the, the same demands that I said on the media seven weeks ago in that I think we should be demanding for adequate... Um, an optimum protection for all our workers, um, mass testing, community testing and tracing so we can suppress this virus, ending the hostile environment. Um, I think we need to be calling for honesty and transparency from our political leaders. Um, and 
I would like them to, I think we need to acknowledge the mistakes that have been made in this crisis so that we can learn from them from future, in future pandemics. Um, and I also think we need to be calling for a genuine, like a genuine commitment to address inequality, to address poverty, um, to address the underfunding of our healthcare services. Um, and as others mentioned, you know, the fragmentation and um, the marketization of our healthcare services and, and, our, and our social care system that it's been on its knees for too many years now. Um, because failure to address those is going to lead to, is going to lead to um, ongoing misery and, and, and preventable deaths in the future. Thank you very much. Great. Pam? Um... Yeah, I think we actually really need to continue to challenge the government on their deadly mistakes. Um, I know somebody put um, that we didn't do a chronological thing of all the mistakes, including the Chelt Cheltenham Festival that went ahead with 250,000 people who were largely Tory donors. Um, and we really do need to keep challenging. And I think um, writing, writing letters to the press. And I agree with everybody. Um, well, I think it's Alison and um, John both mentioned about the, the legislation and the reinstatement of the NHS together with social care. Yeah, that's... Thank you very much, Pam, and, and thank, thank you all. Um, we, we're in the last five minutes now, and um, I've enjoyed this. It's been a little bit nerve-wracking as my first go at this, but... Um, Th thank everybody listening in the background, hundreds of people. Uh, at, at, its, at its most, there were nearly 500 people on the Zoom. I, I don't know about Facebook. Uh, a lot more. But um, a list of announcements, if you can bear it. And um, Tom in the background is also going to put up some links for you which will be therefore available for you after this on this same link in the chat room, but also on our website, Keep Our NHS Public website. So my first plea is that you join us. <laughs> and I, I don't mean liking the Facebook page, I mean join us and be one of us and um, affiliate, uh, a, a small amount of money will get you a great deal of Country. Even in lockdown, we're doing a lot of work. Um, NHS staff voices, any of you here that are members of the NHS, please join on our relatively new but very active and successful NHS staff voices Keeper NHS public group. Um, support us if you can't join us uh, by getting on our newsletter list. There's, there's a link on the website for that. And, and please donate for us because you know, we, we're a tiny organization compared to the likes of Institute of Economic Affairs, for example. We haven't got a single full timer. Um, there's a crowdfunder for, for, to donate to us or you just find it on, on the uh, support us section of the website. Please do look at our website. There's a, an amazing amount of material there. And like our Facebook page and follow our Twitter, please, and uh, Instagram. Um, our, we've got a, a six demand petition, which I referred to on change.org, and that's already got something like, I'm going to say this wrong now, but it's about 280,000 signatures. Um, and it includes a lot of the demands that we've been talking about today. The, the next item I've got very important this meeting is the prelude to the, the opening up of five day screening a, a festival of screening of the under the knife film please do watch that if you haven't seen it and if you have seen it just watch it again um, and tell everybody all your friends to watch it it's available free to view from nine o'clock this evening um, this evening until midnight on Sunday. So that's five days of free viewing. Um, there's events coming up. People's Assembly have got a meeting as, like this. Uh, maybe, maybe they're hoping for it to be a lot bigger. Uh, on Thursday this week, um, what's the date? I've got Thursday the 5th, but that can't be. Thursday the 7th. 
um, and it's it's called Online Takeover Fighting for Our Lives. And they're talking about some, as we're talking about in how this crisis to, to point out all the society and to change it. Um, so that's on Thursday evening. The, we're also organizing another public forum. Uh, Keeper NHS Public um, is supporting health campaigns together who are leading on the coronavirus international lessons. And that's in two weeks time, same time, seven o'clock, 19th of May. And we've got international speakers from Canada, America and Europe. Um, I know there are other parts of the world, but those are the, those are the three we've got lined up to speak alongside John Lister. So that will be very, very good. Um, we're also planning NHS Staff Voices, a, a, a meeting focusing on the issues around the black and minority ethnic community, both staff and the community at large, and the issues that are highlighted by this. So there's a focus on on that, on, on, on racism, injustice, uh, migrant charges, BME, NHS staff, etc. Um, we've got our com Keep Our NHS Public website, Health Campaigns Together website, and I I'll repeat again what I mentioned earlier, the lowdown, that's lowdownnhs.info, that has fantastic daily, well, it's not every day necessarily, but it's a daily uh, news journal, uh, the alternative view on NHS news. So it's a very, very good, and John's the co-editor of that. Ooh, one minute to go. Um, I can't ask anybody if I've forgotten anything off screen, but is there anybody on screen that thinks I've forgotten anything? And uh, Tom, Griffiths in the background and Michael uh, have been filling the chat box, if, that, if that's the right expression, um, the chat room with um, all the links that I've just mentioned. So first of all, can I thank everybody for Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Well, well chaired. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, all the speakers, and thank you very much to the hundreds of people that have tuned in, if that's the right word. And I hope we'll see you again in two weeks' time. Uh, so good night for now and stay safe. Bye-bye.